I think I'm talking to a lot of people who actually think about land use and sustainability as core to their business. And it's a, it's a, it's a challenge I find in, in the market-led kind of philosophy that we have had for many years now in New Zealand that it, there is this gap between what the market knows. I think Angus was talking a bit about it today. It's like what the market knows and responds to. But then there's always this area that people just, if they don't know about it, then how can they know what they could be actually doing? And so, so I think this is, this is where a bit of leadership, a bit of vision is important because it, it, it takes a bit of gumption. And, and I believe I've got a bit of gumption to say, look, I saw that we could, in this country, grow these species. And I, it was a bit like, well, Dan the Torpedoes, there's enough people like Dennis who's here and Angus and other people. I didn't just get to that point on my own. All I've done is really go around and, and feed off and learn from all those people who are already in that space and say, righto, let's get an organised programme so we can create what people we think is possible but what people don't largely know about. So that's, the, that's, a, that's a really strong message from me. Does this thing work? Ah, great. So as Harriet said, there's a team of people. That, that The first team I'm introducing you to are the people that actually made it all happen from the beginning. Our founding partners, um, Proceed New Zealand Vineyard Timbers, which is a start-up company I established myself um, 12 years ago now. Um, re the Mulberry Research Centre Trust, which is the only real regional research institute in the country, and I see now MB are pr planning to, to do something similar and encouraging that all our regions, significant regions, need to have their own research base. It really does make a big difference in the ability of somebody with a good idea in, in, a, in a local region to, to tap into some research and some support. And then the New Zealand School of Forestry, the University of Canterbury, and, and you'll be hearing from Ewan, who's, who's, who's with the team down there. That's the Brains Trust. Think about them as the, and, and there's some incredibly capable people in the team down there that have really got behind this program very early on. There's a suite of people there, supporters and sponsors. I'm not going to take you through those. You'll read them quicker than I can um, run, run, run them out. But you'll see there's regional councils and landowners, some unusual companies like Marlborough Lines, as well as some farm forestry support, which has been very significant. Um, and particularly in a collegial way, the farm forestry group, the support people I know here in the Bay, they've really been you know, huge and, and, and encouraging me. So big part of it. And then more recently we get support from the Forest Growers Levy Trust and from MB and FFR through the new um, Specialty Wood Products Partnership which has only just been introduced in the, in the last few months. And Agmark were one of our seed, seed funders. Questions got to be asked though, you know, the Mulberry Research Centre which is essentially focused on wine research in our region and the guy on the, the left there of the, the sign or the plaque that's being unveiled is John Maris. And John's dead now unfortunately. But he's a hugely influential regional person in Marlborough. He's helped start the wine industry as a young man and, and, and basically by the time we were getting into this he's a multi-millionaire from basically getting out there and doing something that was incredibly novel and new even though today you probably all drink Sav Blanc and think nothing of it. it when I first went to Marlborough they were growing Mulaturga, you know, like it wasn't even on the radar really. And so that kind of innovation, to be in a region where you meet people and you, and you work with people like John, was inspirational for me. And, and he took this project and said, yep, we're into this. You, you've got a really good idea and we'll back you. And that's where I'm saying these regional research institutes where key people in the region get it, they're the ones that really can make things happen. And um, that's what started it, the old wine industry. Basically, big machine harvesters knocking over posts like you can hardly believe, all treated CCA, big piles of, 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 of waste posts. Is this thing working? That photo on the, on the bottom right there, that's not untypical. The wine industry are relaxed about me talking about this. Some of them are early on, didn't want me to say too much, but they all know it's a real Achilles heel to the, to the industry. And, and unfortunately for CCA treated radiata pine posts, there's a raft of issues as a, as a result of their low strength, leading to this high breakage. You've got to replace them. You've got hazardous waste disposal, and, and then there's a, a real issue around they do leach some of the chemicals over time into the soil. So it wasn't hard, basically. 
why don't we just grow a naturally durable post out of a strong piece of you know, wood that will break less anyway and, and deal with all those um, ongoing life cycle issues like you don't have to worry about landfilling them and, and um, in fact you can recycle or just whack them in the fire provided you're not in part of New Zealand now that has clean air rules um, but you know a lot of places that doesn't apply. And, and then being able to, 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 to basically chase getting some wood from trees, these are large global deer found growing up the Wairau Valley and we whacked them through a local mill that was essentially a standard old big circular sawmill didn't take any kind of clever sawing or anything, it was just basically run the stuff through, cut it as fast as we can. Again, this global deer, as you heard from Ben today, it just came off the saw. It was hard, and, and, the, and the saw set probably wasn't right, but we actually demonstrated you could just cut the stuff up in any other way that you'd normally mill a lot of timber. Those are big logs though, and so there's some advantages which I won't elaborate. And then literally the same day those posts were going onto a trailer, across the road and into a vineyard. And so I can stop and go and wiggle a few of them. And the vineyard manager whom I've, I've recently contacted after nine years has had one post break. So we're waiting to see, probably age 15, Dennis, they'll probably all go do 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 do. But that's all right, 15 years is pretty good in a vineyard because they break them at about that kind of rate anyway. They don't last longer than uh, 20, 20 years out of a vineyard post is a, is a decent life. Some of them, you see the new vineyards go in, and then the first round of harvesting, you can pick all the new posts that have had to go in and replace them. And even during posting of the vineyard, they often have losses. So some rough figures there, and I used the Hawke's Bay um, vineyards, 5,000 hectares, roughly 600 posts per hectare. There's more than that now. A lot of them are going to closer spacings, but anyway, you do the math, and there you go. It's quite a decent number of posts. So Ben's resource, um, you know, he could be, in fact, delivering posts into the vineyards, and we need to talk about that because I need some posts in Marlborough. So trouble is, there's no large areas really of these species. So even though there's a marker there, I had an order recently for 20,000 posts. I just simply just said to the guy, look, find me four or five hectares of forest to cut down. That's how little there is out there. And um, so the idea is not new. Australians, um, for years, their vineyards are a lot older than ours, have been growing, uh, not growing them, but just basically taking post wood out of their natural forests and, and, and it was used extensively in all of their vineyards and, and still is. But they're out of that now, they're over that. Joe's been telling me, locking up the forests, can't get that sort of wood. What are they using? That, that bigger picture on the right there, that's in the background is replacements are all CCA treated pine on the Murray River Delta, so get that in terms of an environmental concern. And then we get cross arms, so out of the blue our local wine uh, lines industry, they rang me, said hey can you come and see us, we got an issue. Real major really, that cross arm supports our entire electrical, net electrical network in all of the rural regions, every rural industry depends on power. So this, the, the supply of this product, and most of us don't think about it. We're all driving along, eyes at this level, you don't look at the top of the post. Think about it, and one day you count how many are up there. And uh, it's, it's, one, it's, it's a high value product, and it can only be the actual engineers specify the species that you must use. And I can tell you right now, Basistawana, Global Deer, Quadrangulata, they're all on the list, so we can be into this market. And that's an international market, as is timbers around your wharves, your marinas, waterfronts. I'm sure if I went to Napier here and wandered around your waterfront, there'd be just screes of, of hardwood decking all out of Australia. And look at the sort of dollars that, that are being paid for those sorts of products. Our entire rail network, previously, all of, all of the, your sleepers used to all be Aussie hardwoods. Very hard to now get. Um, Kiwi Rail took timber out of Venezuela in about um, 2008. By 2013 or 12, 2012, they had a major problem on their hand where they'd only deployed 5% of what they'd bought and it was rotting after four to five years. So the whole consignment, of which was a substantial volume of timber and money, basically had to, had to be got rid of. And they introduced two new fungi, even bringing them in. 
So get around your head around the bio, just the biosecurity issues associated with importation of these sorts of timbers, especially from countries that you know really nothing about the wood, who the supplier is, there's no trade agreements or anything like that. Taxpayers, we all took a big hit as a result of that. And then LVL, this is, this is the new stuff, particularly since the Christchurch earthquake, a lot of interest in, in, in these um, solid wood type panels that are either LVL beams um, glued up basically um, uh, timber or the, there's a new cross laminated timber panel factory being built in Nelson and so this is a new building going up in Kaikoura that combines the use of both of these and by adding eucalypt into the mix because this is all pine at the moment we can increase the strength significantly of these types of products so that's one of the big pushes by some of the companies that we're working with is to, is to get a high strength um, veneer that they can add into those products. Export, huge potential. Someone's made the comment today about um, tropical rainforests, supplies, demand, etc. Um, it, it is big and Alan Laurie, who a lot of you I think will know from farm forestry, recent trips to China, he's, he's just confirming this. Huge potential for wood that really does mimic some of the timbers that in the past, teaks about 12,000 a cube the last time I looked at it. Now, I don't care if we don't get 12,000 a cube, but hell, if we were getting three or four, that'd be pretty good. And in the same, there's some rosewood, um, but it's camelgelensis, those little samples I've got over there. They, you can see you get some beautiful timbers. The vision, um, how am I going for time, Harriet? Okay, I'm gonna crank it up now. So you've covered off on that pretty well, thanks Harriet. And there's my slide on sustainability, so I will talk a little bit through this. Small scale processing as possible with no chemical treatment and minimal RNA issues. Now, a lot of you won't know in my career in the past, I've worked in the RMA field. I've been a consultant, I've been fronted hearings and, and committees to deal with all sorts of issues. And I reckon this is, this is one of the gems to this program and, and we didn't really get the best of it out there at Ben's today. But, you know, as compared for him to have to go and post, get post by driving to Gold Pine and cart them all the way back out to his place to put a new fence in compared to having his mill, milling the timber and using it off the site. It's, it's, it's a brilliant. And, and the old way of milling native forests, they took the mills into the forest and you left all the rubbish in there. You transport the sawn timber. So there's some real opportunities in, in terms of a, a whole range of scales that you could have around saw milling. The reverse is true in the pine industry. What's happened in the last 20 years? All the small mills virtually disappeared. I bet you there's not one left here in Hawke's Bay. Is there, Ed? Was it? No. Probably not, is there? No. So we need to go back and put back in place that type of approach. Smaller businesses, New Zealand is built on small and medium businesses. You know, it really is. Can't rely on big corporate enterprises coming in, building massive new plant. A lot of people don't want it. So this is another a gain for us. Lower processing and transport costs as a result, lower carbon emissions. Um, we get high carbon sequestration rates because of the high density of the timbers. The, um, reducing erosion risk and cutover because these things coppice, we haven't talked about that today, but they grow from the roots, the roots don't die. So you're not gonna get the weakening of the whole of the slope as, the, as you do with radiata about three to five years post harvest and there's the potential to grow the regional development side of what happens as a consequence of investment in this. So I think it's a good sustainability option and the comments being made about bees and, and native <coughs> biodiversity, it's as simple as eucalypts are myrtaceae. So in New Zealand, a lot of our plants are in that same category, including manuka, kanuka, all the rata species, pahutakawa. So they're, they're all in the same mix, all fantastic um, bird trees, honey trees, nectar trees. Our ingredients then are success. We, we think we've got it all here. We've got this market going. We're looking for these trees that are adapted to grow productively in New Zealand conditions. We are aiming to produce a high quality hardwood and great, I've got a lot of interested growers and uh, wood processors and, and end users. So we think everything's there to get on with it. So from 2003, we've made a major investment 2.6 million is, is, is the last figures when we, we checked them through. And it was, to me, quite simple to start with, basically do some testing of some species, 
find some good species and just get on with this breeding without appreciating the scale of what the breeding effort would require. And you can see that it was 2008 that we really started into our breeding program. And we had selected from all of the discussion you heard of different species, and I made the comment, tried lots of different candidates. These were our criteria around high natural durability. We want obviously fast growing straight stems, diversity of colour, heartwood, all these things, all in one species, or several. And we've ended up with five. The durability key um, component there's for those of you who, who don't understand natural durability, this is just that part of the standard that relates to in-ground durability. Okay, one, two, three, four, simple as that. The most durable are the class ones. Class twos are pretty good. Class threes, don't bother putting them in the ground, really. Good outside, still though potentially above ground. And class four, that's where radiata sits, untreated. It's, it's no bloody good. It, they, they, you put it out in the weather, and within less than five years, it's just turned to back to the soil. So um, understanding that's key. And so these species here, Basistuana, Argafloia, Quadrangulata, Tricarpa, Global Deer. I've, I've talked about them today already. Um, they, those were our, our choice. Um, the top four are all class one species, and the Global Deer is class two, the stringy bark. So that's our hedging our bets a bit. Research trial sites, a lot of you have heard, we've got trials now from the Bay of Plenty right down into North Canterbury. Um, I won't labour you through all of those, just gives you a sense of the spread. We're crossing to Nelson, as I made the comment, Rogers here from Nelson, and um, we're even into Lake Taupo Forest Trust's lands right next to the lake there. Um, and the pumice soils, that's been an interesting move. So we're actually moving out of the drylands because people are so interested in what we're doing, they want to see what else, what other sites could some of these species be grown. And there's a demonstration of, of how diverse New Zealand's rainfall is and why you can see there is a focus, those browner coloured areas are the drier parts of New Zealand and obviously we've got a heavy concentration of our efforts into those areas but we've now got sites in some of these higher rainfall sites as well to see what kind of variation we get. And then the temperature one, and I know Ewan's going to probably talk more about this, but I just want to, I love this graph because it really does show that the South Island is climatically largely pretty different to the North Island. And in fact, those colours there, if you look at the bar graph down the bottom, I'm going to have to turn away from the camera momentarily here, um, the warmer colours are obviously the warmer parts of the country. So that yellow, that big yellow band around the the, um, the North Island. There's hardly any of that in the South Island. And that's a critical zone, that one there. That's what's that, between four to five degrees July minimum temperatures. Okay, so sorry I should have said that at the beginning. July minimum temperatures, four to five degrees warmer. It's, it's, it's that warm around a, a, a large part of the North Island. And even that green stuff is still two to three degrees. And look how little of that is actually across the ditch, okay? So the big advantage that we've really determined is simply from this map. This, the North Island, just that those three or four degrees minimum temperature differences make a huge difference in what species you can grow. Paul, was that average minimum? Or was that average, average, yeah. So next seven years, we've had seven years to get ourselves established and we've won a significant amount of funding and support from MB and, and, and I should have included FFR in this new partnership. And we're doing a whole lot of work on selection and outcrossing, that's our breeding work, looking at form, wood quality, pest resistance, looking at matching species to site, which is an area that Ewan's working in, modelling management and silviculture, which Dean Meeson, whom I should have welcomed, has come across from Hamilton today to speak to us from Zion, who's, who's a specialist in that area. Just a quick look at some of the research, and I've got two minutes left, three minutes left, so I'm going to whip through it. Tree breeding, hey, go to sleep, boring. When I was at university, I was like, oh God, what's this about? I love it. It's, it's, if there's nothing that we need to do across all of our primary sector industries is get our head around genetics. The only way we're going to boost productivity we're not making any more land. In fact, every time it pours with rain, some of it's ending up in the, down, you know, down the gurgler, down the rivers and into the sea. So, so genetics is key. And, and Harriet's made that point. 
I absolutely am sure we're doing things the right way and focusing on our breeding before everyone starts planting. We really want top trees out there. Um, well now what have I done? And it's asking me for next. So. And, and I, I like this analogy. There's a, a, a top, um, he won't, and El Elridge might not mean anything to you, but perhaps it does to, to Joe, our, our Aussie guest. Um, here's a top botanist or breeder, and he said this about the eucalypts, that they're a, a, a natural, a sack of uncut diamonds, basically. And, and given that it's Australian saying that, and they had this sort of focus on mining, and I thought, yeah, diamonds, that's it. And the other thing is, you know what diamonds are? They're just carbon. They're another form of carbon. So what are trees? They're carbon as well. So our idea of uncut diamonds is a smart one, we think, to move forward with. So we're looking at this diamond durable eucalypt seed collection. We want the best of what the, the species can produce. Done a huge amount of seed collection to find some of these and literally bring that resource of uncut diamonds back in and establish them like a mine, you know, like literally out there on Ben McNeil's property is this genetic resource we plan to mine for the best of those genetics. We've got them also a heap of stuff in, 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 in Marlborough. This is some of our breeding populations uh, in, in, in Marlborough, um, Cravens Road. Those are five-year-old um, Basistuana, so you can see some pretty nice looking trees there. And these are our global deer that um, Angus was talking about down at the Atkinson's property in the Wairapa. Some fantastic individual trees coming through there. And we're looking at the wood quality in there. We really want this heartwood because it's the only stuff that really is naturally durable. There's lots of variation. I talked about genetic variation. There's a demonstration of it. Those, all those little discs there have been cut out of four-year-old stand of Basistuana. They are the rejects. They've been coloured up to show the heartwood. And look, the biggest one, you think, well, that's the best tree. But in fact, it's the one to the left, the most heartwood, that really is the one that you'd be looking at from a breeding point of view. So a lot of work going on there. We're looking at taking cores, new coring equipment being developed with Callaghan, work on the actual natural durability of the heartwood. So you might have a good looking piece of heartwood, but it may not be as durable as the other piece next to it or from the other tree. We won't delve into that, but there are some fast, well, there's NIR spectroscopy is the word. Um, that is one of the areas that we're, the methods that we're looking to screen. Um, growth strain, this is the issue of the log splitting, causing all sorts of grief um, in terms of processing. So we have a new sustainable farming fund program um, with the university based at Woodville where we're doing this field testing in the nursery and screening these trees at age two by doing the splitting test to assess how much growth strain is already in the stem even at age two. And the old prof, Walker, who's very um, you know, he's an amazing character and, and got a great mind on these things. He just says it's as simple as going into the kindergarten and selecting the kids in the kindergarten to work it. If you want a good, you know, team of swimmers, well, you just say, how many of you like the water and how many of them can swim? And teachers and parents tell me which ones are the good ones. Take them out and get them into a, into a special program. Same sort of thing. What we're trying to do is pick these young trees and get rid of the rubbish. We won't get it all right but lift the game very, very rapidly. We don't want to be waiting till I'm, you know, retired and then we go, oh, we've finally found the top trees. We're, we, we're, we're shortening up the cycle much more rapidly. I won't labour you with that graph. Disease resistance, we've got a team working on that. There's definitely a lot of um, insect herbivores. We're at risk from those. Biggest threat really to the whole program is, is a major pest disease out of Australia. Can't stop that. Um, and, but in the meantime, we're looking at the tolerance of some of our species um, to actual insect, insect defoliation, as well as aiming to try and see whether there's any that have genetically better um, you know, ability to, to um, sustain that attack, either by rapidly regrowing or not even being chewed compared to their neighbours. Propagation, I'm nearly there. So, Key to this is delivering good plants, good quality plants, also being able to multiply rapidly our breeding stock up so that we can get seed out to, to, to the market as rapidly as possible. So Proceed, who are just conveniently owned by Naitahu Property Holdings, and if those of you don't know about Naitahu, that's our main iwi in, in the South Island that hold a substantial part of, of um, uh, 
um, uh, investments in there. They're the largest single New Zealand owned corporation in the South Island now, and they are backing us big time. So there is some horsepower behind us in, in being able to then capitalise when we need to to invest in this sort of facility. So this is at Amberley, and we're, we're, we're controlling and doing all the, um, the propagation uh, in collaboration with the university again uh, down there. And we have a plan to commercialise, and this is a quick preview to you of what the future is going to be when you go to the nursery, and that'll be that you'll be looking for plants that are branded with our Xylogene trademark. Okay? XGs they will be, that's all you need to know. It's like buying a new Suzuki, you know, you want the XG 100 series, well, you'll be able to buy the Eucalypt XG 100 series one day. Xylogene, for those of you who want to wonder about that, Xylo is the Greek word for wood, and guess what the Greek word for gene is? Gene. So it's a simple concept around the woody gene. Okay. That seemed to have got a little bit of blank looks. <laughs> if you think I'm mad, tell me now. You know, I like it, obviously. Anyway, how to grow ukes? We, I decided we, we don't want to put a whole lot of slides up about people planting trees and spraying and all that. There's a lot of work being done by Harriet, to a less extent by me. Both the websites, our website and the Farm Forestry website, have a lot of information about how to grow eucalypts, and, and so I urge you to have a look at that. And um, just a bit of a note on, uh, this is just to really put you um, into a bit of an unusual, I don't know really, to think about it. And with an Australian here, it's, 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 I'm, I'm enjoying saying this, Joe. You see, eucalypts did, live in New Zealand naturally. 14 to 19 million years ago, in fact the entire part of New Zealand that was above the water then was covered in equivalent to Aussie basically biota. And fossil records at Lake Manu Hirakaya down in central Otago have, have proven, and there's also fossil records now in South America, that the eucalypts as a genus are only a relic now in Australia. They're not something that's endemic or they may be now, but they, they weren't once. And, and so by planting them in New Zealand, we're simply reintroducing them just you know, 14 to 19 million years later. So if anyone challenges you around native diversity, just say to them, you're just in the wrong epoch. You know? So there you go, thanks to my team. I won't run through all those, but um, thank you very much.